Thank you so much, Adrian. <clears throat> so um, our, our topic uh, for discussion today is the statewide program, the Portable Equipment Registration Program. Um, it's commonly known as PERP. Um, so we have a, a great lineup of experts today who will be giving us the technical uh, deep dive of the statewide program. Um, uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, um, please use the reactions tab to raise your hand during the Q&A section or enter them in the chat box below. Um, we'll do our very best to monitor and elevate it to our speakers when, um, when the time comes, but um, we'll, we'll address those questions during the Q&A uh, section. Um, so I'm gonna actually have Adrian start uh, slide two for Kelly's part, but I'm gonna hand it over to you, Kelly, from the California Air Resources Board to introduce yourself and give the PERP background and overview. Great, thank you, Kathy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Weatherford and I manage the Portable Equipment Registration Program, also known as PERP, along with Tony Zhang uh, here at the California Air Resources Board, also known as CARB. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, the history and general overview of PERP and associated airborne toxic control measure, also known as the ATCM. Uh, next slide, please. So what is PERP? The PERP regulation became effective on September 17, 1997. The regulation allows for statewide operation of portable equipment under a single registration in lieu of multiple local air district permits. PERP is voluntary uh, and fee-based. It's a program um, for portable equipment registration. A PERP registration allows for portable equipment operation throughout the state of California while reducing particulate matter or PM emissions. Through the PERP regulation and portable engine ATCM, CARB establishes portable equipment, uh, excuse me, requirements and issues PERP registrations. While the local air districts make stationary and portable permit determinations and enforce the PERP registrations and requirements. We'll begin our discussion today uh, with PERP regulation, which is found in the California Code of Regulations, Title 13, Sections 2450 through 2465. Next slide, please. So what is portable equipment? The portable definition in the PERP regulation, section 2452 DD, states that in order for an engine or equipment unit to be portable, it must be designed and capable of being moved from one location to another. For example, moving the footprint of the equipment by a foot or two would not qualify. Um, the equipment would still be on the same site uh, at the building or the facility. An engine is not portable if it provides motive power or drives the equipment around either. The portable equipment cannot reside in one location longer than 12 consecutive months, be attached to a foundation, qualify as part of a stationary source, or have recurring operation each year like you would find at a seasonal source. Uh, next slide, please. Portable equipment applies to a variety of engines and equipment units, including compression ignition and spark ignition auxiliary engines, pile driving hammers or pile drivers, equipment units that emit particulate matter, and tactical support equipment, or TSE, which is applicable only to the military. Currently, there are over 51,000 registered units in PERP under approximately 50,000 PERP registrations. Engines, pile drivers, and equipment units are registered individually for a three-year registration duration, while TSE may have multiple units under one registration for each military installation for the duration of one-year registration. Uh, next slide. So starting with the most common equipment, an engine is defined in section 2452K of the PERP regulation as a piston-driven internal combustion engine. Registered engines are typically rated at 50 brake horsepower and greater. However, there are still some instances where engines under 50 brake horsepower are registered. Most all registered engines are compression ignition engines fueled by diesel or um, spark ignition engines fueled by gasoline, natural gas, or propane. Pile drivers may fall into this category as they are necessarily one giant piston. There are usually two types of fuel for pile drivers, 
diesel, which has an emissions requirement of Ringelman 1 or 20% opacity, and kerosene, which has an emissions requirement of Ringelman 2 or 40% opacity. On the next slide, you will see some examples of equipment powered by engines and a pile driver. Um, so on this slide, in the top left-hand corner, uh, you can see a, a basically it looks like a box. It's a generator. To the right of that, the, the green box, if you will, uh, is an air compressor. At the left-hand side is a pump. And then in the bottom right, that is the, the pile driver with the giant piston, as we just mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So portable engines eligible for PERP registration will have an emission control label indicating that the engine is certified to a specific tier level. The label will include the engine manufacturer, serial number or engine number, model number, year of manufacture, brake horsepower rating, or sometimes a kilowatt rating, and the engine family name. The engine family name is the certification code that indicates the yearly standard the engine was certified to. The engine manufacturer engine type, such as the non-road compression ignition engine or spark ignition engine, uh, the engine displacement, followed by sequence uh, characters in the name. CARB's approved executive order will specify the engine family name and tier level of each engine. The next slide will show a general chart for the different tier levels. And some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, this is the off-road compression ignition diesel engine standards chart uh, that shows the different engine tier levels. Tier one is shown in yellow. Tier two is shown in orange. Tier three is in pink. Interim tier four is light purple. And final tier four is shown in dark purple. As indicated on the chart, Manufacturing of final tier four engines began between 2013 and 2015. And it may be kind of hard to see. These are kind of <laughs> small, uh, small chart uh, typing. So um, this chart can be found on the PERP website uh, under the popular resources section. Uh, the PERP website link will be provided at the end of this presentation too. Uh, next slide, please. When PERP issues registration materials, the engine tier is listed on the registration certificate, and all engine registrations have a color-coded placard to easily identify the tier level. Tier 1 engines have red placards. Tier 2 engines have brown placards. Tier 3 engines have green placards. And interim tier 4 and final tier 4 engines have blue placards. Each placard has a registration number, or I'm sorry, registration sticker affixed listing the registration number and expiration date. The next equipment category, equipment units, also has a blue placard. Next slide, please. There is a variety of equipment units registered in PERP. As defined in the PERP regulation under section 2452M, equipment units emit fugitive dust or non-combustion particulate matter, specifically PM10. Equipment units usually have either a drive engine or an auxiliary engine. Um, <clears throat> and in some cases, excuse me, there's a, a auxiliary engine, both the, the engine and the equipment uh, unit may require a portable permit or PERP registration. Equipment units that emit hazardous air pollutants or involve incineration are not eligible for PERP registration and will need to obtain a district permit for that type of operation. Uh, next slide, please. The PERP regulation identifies the following equipment units. There's confined and unconfined abrasion blasting units, concrete batch plants, sand and gravel screening and crushing plants, pavement crushing and recycling units, um, tub grinders, and trommel screens. Wood chippers, slurry mixers, and rock drills are not specifically identified in the PERP regulation, yet have similar emissions to tub grinders, concrete batch plants, and sand and gravel plants, respectively. The photo on the slide shows an example of a rock drill, and the following slide will show a variety of commonly registered equipment units. So here on this slide, on the top left, you have an unconfined abrasive blasting unit. Right next to that, you have a concrete batch plant. And in the far right top, that is a sand and gravel plant. 
Down on the bottom left, you have a tub grinder. In the middle bottom is a wood chipper. And then on the, the far bottom right is a trauma screen. Next slide, please. The last equipment category in PERP is Tactical Support Equipment, or TSE. The PERP regulation defines TSE in section 2452UU as equipment using a portable engine or turbine that meets military specifications that is owned by the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Military Services, or its allies. The equipment may only be used in combat, for combat support or combat services, in tactical operations or relief operations, or in training for any of these specific types of operations. TSC is exempt from most of the requirements of a typical PERP registration and has separate annual process for registration. Of the few requirements that TSC has, the emissions requirement for TSC is Ringelman 2 or 40% opacity. Also, TSC does not have registration stickers or placards since multiple units are listed under one registration. Next slide, please. The other regulation that governs PERP, as well as the local air districts, is the Airborne Toxic Control Measure for diesel particulate matter from portable engines rated at 50 horsepower and greater, or the shorter moniker, the Portable Engine ATCM. The Portable Engine ATCM became effective on March 11, 2005, as a result of the Diesel Risk Reduction Plan developed by CARB after diesel particulate matter was identified as a toxic air contaminant in 1998. The portable engine ATCM only applies to portable diesel engines rated at 50 brake horsepower and greater and does not apply to spark ignition engines, equipment units, or TSE. The portable engine ATCM is found in the California Code of Regulations, Title 17, Sections 93116 through 93116.5. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the portable engine ATCM is to reduce diesel particulate matter by limiting older diesel engines from entering California through permitting and registration requirements and requiring each portable diesel fleet to follow a fleet emissions reduction option. As defined in section 93116.2A17, the portable engine ATCM um, large and small fleets consist of a specific brake horsepower composition from all portable engines under common ownership and control, as determined on June 30th, 2019. On that date, large fleets had a total cumulative brake horsepower over 750 from all of their portable engines. Conversely, small fleets had a to total cumulative brake horsepower of 750 or less from all of their portable engines. The reason why fleets were determined in this way was to align with the off-road regulations definition of common ownership and control, as well as create a straightforward compliance pathway. Uh, next slide, please. Once a fleet was identified as large or small, the compliance pathway was established for the fleet. For small fleets, the tier phase-out schedule for diesel engines applies. For large fleets, there were two options to choose from, either the tier phase-out schedule or calculate and report the weighted particulate matter emission fleet average for all applicable engines. Both compliance pathways have exemptions for engines specifically designated as low use and emergency use engines. For fleets following the tier phase-out schedule, retrofitting an engine um, prior to the phase out with a level three verified diesel emissions control strategy, such as like a diesel particulate filter or a DPF, um, this would exempt the engine from phasing out. However, fleets following the fleet average option would still need to report retrofitted engines in their fleet average calculations. The next slide shows the tier phase out schedule. So this is the tier phase out schedule listed in section 93116.3 C1A of the portable engine ATCM. As you can see, non-retrofitted full use tier one engines and tier two engines rated at 750 brake horsepower or less may no longer operate in California. Well, except with those exemptions previously mentioned. 
Uh, for tier two and the engines over 750 brake horsepower and tier three engines, the schedule stages the phase out for these engines based on manufacturer date for both tier levels. Engines built under flexibility provisions to previous tier levels also phase out 17 years from the manufacturer date of the engine. Interim tier four and final tier four engines do not phase out. The tier phase out schedule applies to all PERP registered and district permitted portable diesel engines rated 50 brake horsepower and above, unless owned by a large fleet following the fleet average option. The next slide will show the, the fleet PM standard requirements for this option. So this is the fleet PM standard table listed in section 93116.3 C2 of the portable engine ATCM. The fleet PM standard requirements only apply to large fleets who opted into this compliance pathway and registered all portable diesel engines with PERP such that PERP staff can readily identify any compliance issues and supplement any district enforcement. As you can see, there are three compliance dates to meet the fleet average PM, <clears throat> excuse me, the fleet average PM standard and the calculations include all engine brake horsepower categories. The goal of these compliance options is to achieve diesel particulate matter emissions reductions and also reduce oxides and nitrogen from portable equipment such that only the cleanest engines operate throughout the state of California. Uh, next slide, please. And so while this presentation only scratches the surface of portable equipment, uh, there are many resources and staff available to help navigate the program. Uh, please visit the WPERP website and subscribe to the notifications for program updates and deadline reminders. I appreciate everyone's time and thank you all for joining in. Um, we'll be glad to answer any of the questions during the Q&A session. And for now, I'll turn it back over to, to Kathy. Yes, thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate you giving the background on PERP and an over, a general overview as well. Uh, as a reminder, we'll also share resources in the presentation slides as a follow-up to the meeting. Um, but now, uh, bef you know, before we begin the technical deep dive on PERP, I would like to invite the panelists, our Air District's representatives, to introduce themselves and also give an overview of their local Air District. So I'm going to actually hand it over to Carla to introduce yourselves. All right, thanks, Kathy. Uh, glad to be here. I'm Carla Sanders with the Feather River Air Quality Management District. Uh, my district is the northern portion on that map that you see. Uh, we are a small, small rural bi-county district serving Yuba and Sutter counties. Uh, we have 11 employees, three in compliance and two engineers. Our resident population uh, in 2010 census was about 165,000 um, total for both counties. Uh, we do have uh, mostly rural ag kind of operations. Um, our unique situation is we do have a military base, so we do deal with the TSE at our military base, uh, Bill Air Force Base. Uh, our district has um, approximately 693 stationary source facility permits, um, and those permits may have uh, multiple processes on them. We have about six major sources, mostly uh, natural gas power plants, and we do have one active landfill. So that is a, a quick summary of my district, and I'll pass it on over to Angela for SAC Metro. Hi, I'm Angela Thompson with the SAC Metro Air District, and I'm the Compliance Manager. The SAC Metro Air District covers Sacramento County. Um, we have just over 1.5 million in population. And while Sacramento County does have some rural areas, we are primarily urban. Um, most of our perps are part of construction businesses or rental operations. And we have 15 major sources and over 4,400 local permits that we issue. And now I'll pass it over to Emmanuel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Orozco, and I'm the Permitting and Engineering Manager here at Placer County APCD. 
Uh, Placer County APCD has a total of 18 full-time staff, and it serves the entirety of Placer County, which has a population of approximately 420,000. Uh, we're considered a medium-sized air district, and we have a broad range of stationary sources, ranging from smaller emergency engines and natural gas boilers, uh, all the way to industrial-scale lumber mills and utility power generating facilities. We have roughly 1,800 stationary source permits to operate, and we have a total of five federal major sources in the district. And I'll pass it off now to Paul with Yellow Solano. All right, yeah. Hi, Paul Hensley. I'm the Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer at Yellow Solano. And uh, obviously, as the name implies, we have all of Yolo County, but we only have half of Solano County. So we have the Vacaville, Dixon, Rio Vista half. But once you go down through the uh, Lagoon Valley uh, into Fairfield, that's no longer in our district. That's in the Bay Area, AQMD. Um, we are um, a medium district as well, considered a medium district. We've got 23 full-time employees. Um, we are got a lot of ag in, industry in our uh, jurisdiction including a lot of post-harvest processing, rice mills, nut processing, tomato plants. Um, we have about uh, 1,500 uh, stationary sources with about 1,900 permits to operate. And we do have uh, nine federal Title V facilities. So that's kind of a real quick overview of our district. Thank you all for those intros and giving us an overview of your air districts. Um, so, so now we're going to actually go into the technical portion of the air district roundtable. Um, I'll hand it over to you, back back over to you, Carla, to start us off. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over what districts look at in PERP. Uh, we, uh, this is an ARB program, but the districts are tasked with the enforcement of the program. And the program is voluntary. Um, if you don't want to get 35 different district air permits for portable equipment, but the regulations and registration conditions are not voluntary. So there are requirements that each owner of an engine or equipment unit must follow. So what the districts look at is um, initially, um, how is that registered engine or unit being used? And is that user following all those conditions and requirements in the regulation and the registration? Um, so real quickly, next slide. The um, Once you receive your registration, uh, you wanna make sure you do read all the conditions and registration requirements. Uh, you will receive that colored tier placard and your sticker. You wanna make sure that your if you're doing multiple units or engines, that the correct sticker is going on the correct placard, which is going on the correct engine. Because one of the things districts look at is to make sure that the engine or equipment unit that is registered is in fact the one on that registration with that number and that tier. The um, just You'll probably hear this multiple times in this presentation, but equipment units, um, do not include its power source. So if you have an equipment unit that's powered by an engine over 50 horsepower, that unit will have a registration for the engine and one for the equipment unit. You'll have two on that piece of um, equipment. The uh, It's on the owner of the equipment or engine to notify the home district when a new registration or renewed registration is issued. There's a 45 day window, which you must notify the home district. Once the home district receives that notification, uh, they'll contact you to schedule that inspection. And uh, there is a time limit to complete that inspection. Uh, I will note that a lot of uh, districts who deal with a lot of PERP, if your engine or unit is out of your home district, um, districts talk and they can arrange that inspection wherever that engine or unit is. Um, I know I've done SAC metros and and I think Paul's um, in my that are in my district. And likewise, I know Bay Area has done mine. I think SAC Metro has done mine as well. So um, if don't worry if your engine or unit is out of the home district, those arrangements can be made to get that in, initial inspection done. Uh, you do want to notify the district uh, for any equipment unit that's gonna be in that district for more than five days. 
Uh, you do want to make sure you're keeping all the records on your registration and report if there's reporting requirements uh, to ARB um, as applicable on your registration. The um, Go ahead, next slide. So when the district comes and does the inspection, um, we are basically checking that you have read and understand the registration and the conditions. So you wanna make sure you have any applicable paperwork uh, with you for that engine or unit. Um, you wanna make sure you know what allowable uses are for your engine or your equipment unit. Um, the registration uh, program has different requirements for rental engines than other engines. It has different requirements for PEPs. It has different requirements, whether you're located, you know, just in the valley uh, or whether you're located in some kind of state territorial water area. So knowing where you're operating and what you're doing, um, that's, that's on you as owners or operators to know uh, what, what the allowable uses of that engine or unit are. Um, you wanna make sure you know that, uh, that it's, how it's being used on the job site. So if you're, if the district uh, receives a complaint and comes out and sees you plugged into a building, they're gonna start asking questions. And the, um, so if you know that you're there for an electrical upgrade, that upgrade has been notified to the district, the, there's not gonna be any problem. So you wanna make sure you know how it's being used on the job site. Uh, you do wanna be able to turn it on if requested to do so by the district. You do need to know how to read your hour meter. Um, and again, if your equipment unit is powered by an engine, you want to have all that engine information registration as well. The um, So that's pretty much what a district's going to do when they pull up on your site. Um, and um, we're going to talk, I'm going to pass it off to Angela, who's going to talk more about um, when those engines or equipment units are at a stationary source for the district. Thanks, Carla. Um, can we go to the next slide? Great, thanks. So um, Carla talked about uh, PERPs at construction sites and PERP is pretty straightforward when we look at construction sites and industries that move around, right? Such as tree trimming. But what we spend a lot of our time doing at the district level is seeing how these PERPs interact with our stationary sources and whether you can use a PERP or not. So I'm gonna talk about some kind of common examples of using a PERP generator because the PERP regulation has some very specific carve outs for using generators um, to provide either prime power or backup power. So on the face of it, the regulation does allow um, generators to provide primary or supplemental power to a stationary source, but it's in very, very specific situations. So that example, of Carla alluded to it, a portable engine at a building. So um, if that building has no district permits and you bring in a perp one time for an outage or maintenance, um, you can technically do that, but but it can't stay there and it can't keep returning. So if you have, you know, most of the time we're going to recommend if you have the need for backup power, you should be getting a district permit for that location. And you can keep another interesting thing is you can have a perp, um, you know, under a district permit and it operates under a permit at that location and it can still have perp uh, registration and go to different sites. Um, so uh, let's see. The next, another part of the regulation that comes into play with PERP powering stationary sources is um, the, the regulation says that PERPs cannot operate as part of a stationary source. And um, we it's important to note that what is a stationary source is determined by the district. So if you have a situation like that, you should talk to your district and explain how you're using the PERP and if, if it's part of the stationary source. In um, this picture, you can see an example of a PERP providing power to a, a concrete batch plant. This is an interesting example because the batch plant is, is actually also portable, um, but it's at a stationary source and it's part of that stationary source. Um, it's not leaving, it's not temporary, it's, it's there to stay. So in this example, they're using that perp generator to provide prime power to that stationary source. And in most cases, that's actually not allowed, but in this case, it is allowed, and Carla alluded to this, and we can go, up, go ahead and move to the next slide, 
because this would be an example of an electrical upgrade. So the per, um, regulation actually has a specific section where it says with these uh, power generation, um, you can use um, the PERP to provide prime power or supplemental power during an electrical upgrade operation. Um, but you, it has very strict um, requirements for that. And you first, you only have 90 days. Um, in some cases, districts can and will authorize this in writing for more than 90 days, but it needs to be just like I said, authorized in writing. Um, and often this provision is used if a facility needs to increase their electrical infrastructure, maybe they're expanding their operations or they need more power. Um, next slide, please. So another common example where we see PERPs being used as stationary source um, is in the case of when your district permitted generator breaks. So this is the picture of a broken generator. And um, many times these, um, when these pieces of equipment break, it can take a while to fix them. Uh, you, they, may, they may need to order parts. And a lot of facilities or buildings, they have to have uh, backup power at all times. So they will bring in a perp. Now the regulation allows this, but again, it's a, it's not um, straightforward. You, there's very specific requirements. Um, you have to notify a district within 72 hours, the, the replacement engine, so that perp that you're gonna rent, it has to have a lower mass per unit emission rate, um, the same or lower, I think, than your permit. So you may not know that, and you may not be able to figure that out by looking at your permit. So it would be in your best interest to contact your district before you get that rental um, perp generator. In addition, the rental perp must comply with all your permit conditions. Now this can be um, authorized for 180 days and similar to the electrical upgrade, if you uh, receive a written approval by the district, it can be authorized for longer than 180 days, but it cannot exceed 12 months. So um, on all of these slides, I just wanted to note, I did include references to the portions of the regulation. So uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Emmanuel and he's gonna touch on some more examples of perps being used at stationary sources where perps are not allowed. All right, thanks, Angela. So despite the portable nature of PERP registered equipment, uh, there are times when a district stationary source permit is required prior to commencing operation of the equipment. And uh, I'll just use this opportunity to, to really emphasize that reaching out to your local air district prior to beginning operation is, is critical when you know, uh, making these determinations. They, they can assist you making the determination and you can proceed accordingly. So in the next few slides, I'll describe when those permitting requirements apply, and I'll also provide some case studies to, to show as examples. In general, the requirement to obtain a district permit revolves around the equipment being used as a standalone stationary source or as part of a stationary source. Uh, oftentimes, um, you know, that stationary source determination is made based on a fixed geographic location. Um, if the equipment is there for, for more than 12 months, for backup power, you know, this can include operational staging. So not just the, the equipment running during that time, but is it ready to be operated at that time, basically at the flip of a switch or at the loss of power, uh, primary power specifically. Um, another example is if the equipment is used in recurring operations or also that's referred to as a seasonal source of operations. Um, so if it's brought back to the same site for, call it, you know, four months, five months at a time, but that's happening every year for, for you know, multiple years, at that point, it is considered a seasonal source and a stationary source permit is needed. Other things that districts look at is, uh, or other things that districts look at are whether it's supplementing an existing stationary source that has a district permit. Um, if the portable equipment shares upstream or downstream process flow as the permitted stationary source, then that's a good indicator that it is part of the stationary source itself. Okay, can you go on to the next slide, please? So in this example, um, there is a, a microgrid that has been set up where uh, the geographic location is, is pre-established, uh, the electrical interconnection infrastructure is, is permanently installed and uh, there's been a, a location identified where an applicant is proposing 
to install multiple electrical generators, um, oftentimes in the, the megawatt scale of power generation. Um, the microgrid system is designed for a, a predetermined electrical demand, and the need to use the portable equipment is reasonably foreseeable. So for, for all of these reasons, the portable equipment in this case is uh, needing a district stationary source permit um, because it's expected that it's going to be used. Um, the, the geographical location has been established and basically everything is in line to, to trigger the stationary permitting requirements. It's no longer being used in the portable sense that the PERP regulation was intended for. Go on to the next slide, please. Now in Placer County, uh, it's a largely forested area, the, the, the entire county or a large portion of the county, I should say. And so it's very common to see arborists and tree contractors towing around uh, wood chipping and wood grinding equipment to various locations. Um, in most cases, that is the appropriate use of, of the PERP program. However, in this example here, we have a large wood chipper that's been sited at one location and is basically operating at this one location for a prolonged period of time. Uh, the engine and the biomass grinder remains on site indefinitely, and materials actually being transported to the processing site from multiple off site locations. Operation of the equipment is expected to take place throughout the calendar year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in this case, a district authority to construct and permit to operate is required. If the operation of the equipment was staged across multiple parcels or was following, say, a tree crew moving through a neighborhood or, or through the county, then the perp, of course, would be allowed. Um, but because it is staged predominantly at one site and because uh, material or process uh, throughput is being brought to the site, um, this is a clear example where a stationary source district permit is needed. Uh, next slide, please. And in this example, we have a reclaimed asphalt pavement or wrap grinder uh, that is being proposed at an existing asphalt plant where the asphalt plant has a district permit. The wrap is an upstream process to the asphalt batch plant and the portable equipment was requested to be temporarily brought on site to supplement the facility's wrap processing capabilities. So it is a direct upstream uh, process to a permitted operation. Um, one of the reasons why this operation would require a district stationary source permit is because it has the potential to conflict with existing permitted limits with the district's permit to operate. Um, in addition, the, the additional emissions generated by the portable equipment are usually needed to be taken into account in the facility's broader inventory. So for these reasons, a district authority to construct and permit to operate would be required for the portable equipment, uh, namely the engine powering, the, the wrap grinding equipment, and the wrap grinding equipment itself. And with that, I'll pass it off to Paul Hensley with Yellow Solano AQMD, who will talk a bit about the ag perspective and frequently observed violations within the PERP program. Thanks, Emmanuel. So yeah, we've been talking about using PERP at stationary sources, but what happens when that source is an agricultural source? And uh, of course, there's a long history in California of some special provisions for agricultural and then some of those provisions going away. So um, some district rules, some of the district's rules still have some provisions that treat the ag sources a little bit differently. Um, because of that, uh, again, I think some other people have highlighted it before you operate it or hire somebody to do a job for you or contract. Uh, it's very important to contact your local district. Um, some districts may uh, require a traditional stationary source permit. Some may, uh, our district has a rule for district registrations, which is different than our permits, has different uh, approvable requirements or may allow perps. So uh, one thing is uh, obviously with the ag, there's always a discussion of right to farm and there's generally no right to farm exceptions or exemptions from the need to have a permit. There might be some for nuisance, uh, but again, that's highly qualified and depends on using standard uh, industry practices as well as having a three years uh, 
of operating uh, on the site. So, um, but there are maybe some cases where perp would be allowed at ag and there may not be. So next slide. Uh, a couple of the examples we've seen for ag, of course, one would be pumping water. We get that a lot. Uh, most of our district registrations uh, that we have, at least for our district, are for uh, pumping, for engines driving pumps. They could either be direct drive pumps uh, um, connected to a gearhead or out of a ditch, or it could be a, a generator driving an electric pump. Um, the other common one is dr uh, grinding of the orchard material, similar to Emmanuel's uh, for the forest uh, material, either again, tub grinder or horizontal grinders. The other thing is the drilling for water wells or re reworking a well. Um, one key point is generally if the equipment is owned or operated by an independent company, not the farmer themselves, whether it be a rental, you know, they're renting it or they have a contractor, those if the district had ag exemptions, those don't generally qualify for the ag exemptions. So it really is. Uh, at least in the way our rules are written and some of the others is in order to get any type of treatment, it has to, the equipment has to be used exclusively for the raising of crops or, or the growing of crops or the raising of fowl. It has to be done by the farmer on their own farm. So next slide. So some of the things that, and again, all of our districts, we uh, there are 35 districts in the state, but uh, all the districts, generally all the districts have field staff as we observe equipment, some of the, we stop and inspect it. Some of the things we see are operating without a uh, either a portable equipment or an equipment unit or an engine is operating without a permit or PERP. And again, as it's been said a couple of times, the PERP is voluntary, but the underlying district permit requirement is not. So if somebody is operating an engine or equipment unit and they don't have PERP, then generally what we would do is cite them for operating without a, without a permit. Uh, so they would be installing the equipment unit or the engine without a district permit. The other common thing we see is uh, either incorrect stickers. Uh, Carla mentioned, make sure you put the right one on the right unit, especially some of the larger companies and the rental companies that have multiple units, uh, some of them hundreds of units. Um, so put the right sticker and placard and carry the right paperwork with that engine because that we do check to see that the serial number on the engine matches what's on the paperwork and on the placard. Um, also failure to comply with permit conditions. So if, you know, we, we do issue violations for opacity violation or NOVs for opacity violations or failure to keep records or not notifying if you're going to operate an equipment unit more than five days at a location. Another real common one is having an expired perp, you know, so, um, sometimes they, uh, you know, either don't renew them or they might renew it, but never put the new sticker on the unit. So, um, I guess another one too, I didn't make it in my in my slide notes. I forgot about it, but a real common one too is purchasing an equip a uh, piece of perp from somebody else and not transferring the registration. So the perp requires within 30 days of, of purchase that you transfer it. So um, the previous owner may have known what to do and did the right thing and had it registered. And then they sell it. Um, and the new owner has no clue, even though this placard is on there, they uh, don't know what that means. So um, and again, the last one being a common thing is operating at one location for more than 12 months. And I think that was, oh, the takeaway, you know, again, PERP is optional, but the underlying district permits are not. And generally all throughout California, especially I know for at least the first, the five districts that are, or the four districts that are on this call, it's not voluntary. Uh, the permit is required. Um, and just because you register in PERP doesn't mean that you're in compliance with the regulations. So um, that's a great first step, but you do have to read the conditions and, and follow the terms. Um, and it doesn't, the PERP doesn't supplement or exempt the need to have a district permit where a permit is required at the district determination of the district. And again, if you're, whether uh, you're the one going to be purchasing it, or if you're going to rent a piece of equipment or even hire a contractor, um, some people say, well, I'm hiring a contractor, that's their responsibility. But if it slows down your job, you don't care what the reason was, or, you know, even if we're finding the, we're going after or shutting down the contractor, if it slows down your job, that's not going to be good either. So contact the local district and communication with the uh, regulators is key. And I think that, yep, there you go. That was the end of my points. Thank you, everyone. I uh, really want to give a huge thank you to our speakers today. Um, so, you know, as a, as Paul mentioned, if you have any PERP related questions and comments, um, here's the contact info. Again, we'll share this in a follow up email with recording. And we're going to actually jump into the Q&A portion um, 
of our, our presentation, but was wondering, um, do we have any volunteers for questions so far? And I actually see a question from Adrian. Do you get dinged if you renew your perp, but don't put the new stickers on your equipment? You can, and we have, uh, again, each district, there's four districts on here have different enforcement strategies, so it's hard to generalize, but, um, you know, sometimes that can be, uh, you know, just a warning the first time. Other times, if you've done it multiple times, we've had cases with rental companies where just about every year we catch a couple of their rental units out in the field without placards on there or with expired placards, and we find them about $5,000 twice a year, and and uh, I guess we're going to have to keep up in it because they keep doing it, so they haven't gotten the point yet, so. Thanks, Paul. And um, I see Jenna's hand is raised. Go ahead, Jenna. I do. My question is how long has this program been in effect? Because if it's been a while, I'm pretty sure I violated it. <laughs> so the the program did, uh, it was adopted in, in uh, 97 so that it became effective back then. Um, and it's been ongoing ever since. Um, and the districts have had permit requirements well before that. So um, PERP was put in place uh, just to basically be able to operate throughout the state. Like Carla had said, instead of getting 35 different air district permits, you could get one. But yeah, the, the district rules have been in place for some time. Well, cool. Um, totally violated it. I'll make sure that the guy who took over for me where I violated it knows that that's a requirement. I do have one question for CARB. Um, so you guys have gotten a lot better about responding to and sending out electronic communications through your new email chain. Um, there's doors and truckers that have different databases. Like if I want to see all my perp stuff, which sometimes gets kind of wild and wooly because of the amount of different like groups that are buying things, I have to ask you guys for a spreadsheet and you guys send it, which is great. But do you guys have any plan for kind of creating a database where I could just log in, see that, pay those invoices online without having to go through that weird process of paying invoices? Yeah, the mail process, that does slow everything down. And we've been trying to move away from that. Um, and it's it's going to take a couple more years to get to that point. But we are actively working to try to have a more electronic process and eventually have an online registration system to where, you know, registrants can log on and view their inventory, be able to, uh, you know, submit applications online and go that route instead of going through the mail or reaching out to us to get a spreadsheet all the time um, to have some real time information by just logging in. But again, that'll take a, a couple of years still. We've we've made some some good advancements with the email and billing invoices and with renewal invoices as well. Um, but it's it's been a pretty slow rollout because I mean it's it's a big a big amount of work to move into this area and get it right too. We don't want to put it out there and then have it completely fall on its face either. So right, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Those are excellent questions and comments so far. Um, do we have any more questions? Adrian, how much money do some of the violations cost? Does it differ by district? Any takers? I'll, I'll start and anyone else can. I mean, it differs, of course, by district. We all have framework in the health and safety code that um, kind of guides our violation process and districts do do that differently. They administer violations differently. But as a general like way of describing it, a violation, um, the maximum, the minimum maximum, I guess it's kind of a play on words, but the, there's different categories for days. And the maximum um, per day, depending on the category, starts at 5,000. Well, it goes all the way up, I think, to a million if it's criminal. So most of these type of violations, I think, for most districts are going to live in um, in a, a lower per day category, but if it goes on for many, um, like many months or up to a year, I mean, you can have huge violations from from perps, at, especially when they're at stationary sources and it, they're, uh, you know, really like, because perps a lot of times are gonna be dirtier um, or more emissive than permitted equipment would be. And it's not as rigorous to um, perp it as it is to permit it. So I 
I would say like something like for our district, something um, like for getting a, a, a more administrative type of problem with your stickers and stuff. And we find you out in the field, but you can, you know, you're not registered, but you can get registered. You're going to be looking at uh, under $5,000 maybe, uh, but something really egregious where you were using something that should have been, um, we thought it perp was loud and it wasn't. Um, it could be, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or more. So really depends, but we all, it's really hard to throw out amounts like this because it's really specific to the situation. Does anybody else want to? I'll, I'll jump in there too, Adrian. Uh, the I'll give you the range. We've seen it for zero penalty. Just the, you know, it's a more of a warning, uh, notice to comply type of thing. Get put the right sticker on it. To the largest case I'm aware of uh, was up in Mendocino County, and Carla knows uh, the case MCM Construction, uh, where they sued. It was a, a knowing and willing violation. Of the company thumbed their nose at the district, and they got the uh, the uh, DA involved or the Attorney General, and it was about a four million dollar settlement. So, um, you know, for our district, the average is probably in the couple thousand dollar range, up to five to ten thousand for most violations. And again, more of those are things that are Result in an impact, you know, we all consider as part of that health and safety code, what are the mitigating and aggravating circumstances? So if it's an uh, older tier, dirtier engine, and it's right next to a resident that's causing complaints and a public nuisance, then it's going to generally be a higher fine than one that had no emissions violations or that was uh, quickly remedied. So the longer it goes and the dirtier it is, the higher the penalty. I do have one more question too, kind of for CARB. Um, so obviously I think you guys are kind of constrained by the federal rules, but with a lot of the portable stuff, what we've seen over the last few years for infrastructure projects is they get delayed or slowed down for some reason. Is there any sort of conversation that CARB is having with you know, EPA to kind of figure out a way to extend that 12 month period? Because there has been times where we have brought in equipment and then we've kind of had to abandon the perp reg and then just submit for application because of holdups for Caltrans or whatever it is, but it's only like a few months. So is there any sort of like wiggle room that you guys are looking with the EPA to kind of manipulate the rules or change the rules that we don't have to go get a permit for something like getting a stationary permit for some of that stuff kind of burdens the districts. And so I was wondering if you guys have explored that. So the, the regulation, the perp regulation does state 12 consecutive months. And if it's in storage and this varies from district by district, um, a lot of times that storage time does not count towards that 12 consecutive months. And, and I'll let, I'll let Paul and Angela and Carla and Emmanuel step in if that's different. Um, but if it's, if it is set up in an operational configuration, like it's ready to go, or it's, it's, you know, it's going to start operating any minute um, that could be seen as the start of the clock. Basically um, there's nothing that I've seen come through that, that anyone's talking with EPA on extending that time frame, um, that that portable definition is is pretty cemented in the the one you know less than twelve consecutive months, so one year's time. But um, but yeah, I, as far as like storage or if it's not going to operate at any point in time until you know a couple months later. Um, honestly, that would be something that I would recommend you contact the district over and keep them updated as to what's going on. And, you know, it's always best to reach out to them because they're they're in charge of the enforcement and they're going to be the most familiar with what's going on, what kind of operation and, and what's needed. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's that's the challenge sometimes, right? As we set it up, we we send a QC sample to Caltrans and then all of a sudden the project gets halted for four to six months and then we've ran out of clock and then we're winding up having to get stationary source permits and so that's where you know trying to figure out a way at some point maybe where we don't have to get those under this PERP program that I, I know you guys are stuck kind of with the rules that EPA has set but 
that'd be, a, I think, a way that in the future that would help manage the infrastructure projects moving forward. Yeah, and and again, like Paul had in, in his speaking point there about communication is key. Um, that's really what you're going to want to do is reach out to that district and, and chat with them. Um, you know, a lot of perps, uh, a lot of the provisions in perp was stemming from district uh, rules and, and how they handle portable permits and things. And we have adapted it to a, a statewide level, but, um, yeah, your, your best bet would be to talk with, with the districts and keep them updated. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly, for uh, for answering that. An excellent question, Nick, um, and really great insight into the state program, and especially on the local level. Um, do we have any further questions? I don't see any further questions in the chat, and I don't see hands raised. Um, I actually have a couple questions, and um, it's kind of you know kind of piggybacking on what um, you know Nick said, and also what Kelly said. Communication is key. Um, I, I think this is a, also a question for all uh, air district representatives as well. What it, What is one advice you would recommend for operators under the program? Do we have volunteers for that question? It's pretty broad, but just one advice. I'd say when in doubt, you reach out to either PERP staff or district staff. Um, you know, don't don't ignore it. If you have a question about it, there's a lot of people who have a lot of information and know the rules or the regulations and can help. Um, even if it's like, where do I get this form to submit the application? Um, you know, we can help out with that. Um, and I know districts have their their permit, uh, you know, their permit methods as well. So. Yeah, and just to just to tag on to that, I, I would say, you know, don't communication is key, of course, but don't be afraid to get kind of into the nuances of your specific project. I mean, going off of what, what Nick asked earlier, um, where districts can will will introduce as much flexibility into the enforcement as as possible, as long as it makes sense and it's consistent with our rules and, and the PERP program. Um, but if we don't know about it and, and we don't know those details, you know, oftentimes we have to assume, uh, you know, the worst for lack of a better term. So please don't be afraid to share those those details and that information so that we can help guide you to the, per the correct permitting path or, or the use of the PERP equipment within the context of the regulation. My one piece would be, uh, it's already been said before, but read your registration, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've gone out to the field and, and we talked to somebody and first off, also, I guess, in conjunction with that, if you have staff, educate them about the program, because most times people, when we talk to them in the field, they've never heard of PERP, even though there's a sticker on it. So they call their office and then they say, oh yeah, there's a paperwork in the glove box or in the, so somewhere, you know, and then once you look at it, they've never even seen it, you know, so, and right on, it's got all the operating conditions. It's the roadmap for compliance. So that my, my one piece is read your PERP and, or have your staff read the PERP. I'll continue on. I feel like there's a lot of overlap with, with what we're saying and similar messaging, which is great. Um, but uh, read your information in the regulation, but don't assume you can interpret it because the, the regulation and the interplay with our local regulations is not clear and straightforward and easy to understand. Like you need uh, the districts to help you. So um, so read everything and try to understand it, but don't assume you you figured it out, so to speak. Look to us to, to walk you through that. And like Emmanuel said, to your exact situation, we, we will help you and explain exactly why we landed where we did. And I will tag on to that and complicate it even further. Um, not only all of that, but when you contact the district, understand that a district enforcement or interpretation is going to be different from another district. So if, if you're operating in an attainment area up in MODOC, their, their enforcement or interpretation might be different from South Coast in a non-attainment area. 
because they have different rules. And so they have different thresholds. And so they're gonna have different interpretations of when they're gonna act. So um, those, that's an extreme example, but you know, our, our, we're very similar here in the Valley. We try to be anyway, but there are subtleties and there are differences. So don't assume that SAC Metro's interpretation is always going to be the same as Emmanuel's or Paul's or mine. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, what, what I hear is speak to your local air districts. Yes, communication is key. And, you know, every situation is different, but, you know, we're all here to work together. Um, and, and actually, I see in the chat, um, Adrian has another question. I'm assuming that California was first out of the gate with this program. Have other, have other states adopted similar rules? Question. I think many other states don't have permitting requirements down to 50 horsepower engines and or for portable engines. You know, a lot of the state programs um, really don't get, get down to this level. They're pretty much only permitting the major sources or the large stationary sources. So I think probably we, we are a little bit unique in, in the role that we have or the rules we have in California, but that's not the first time and it won't be the last time. Nevada has some kind of comparable rules, but they're not, they don't have a statewide program. So like NDEP controls, which is the state, they, they control a few different areas and there's Washoe County and then Lyon County. So they have something kind of similar, but you get a, a weird permit that's kind of like a per permit there. Um, and then you can use that within their jurisdiction, but it's nowhere close to the, um, the PERP permit where it covers the whole state. I think the PERP program does have a lot of benefits that I've never seen in any other places we've operated, but I think they're looking at it, but it's, it's a weird, it's a weird rule. <laughs> also, I think it's very beneficial for a lot of the operations we do in the state, especially having as many districts as we do. So we do appreciate it. It does create some complications though, but it is a great rule. Yeah, as being one of the people that was permitting sources before the PERP, uh, one of the dinosaurs in the room, I, you know, I was in San Joaquin and mo many of our district's rules date back to the 70s and they said stationary sources need a permit. And it, or it said, if you omit, you need a permit. It didn't say stationary sources. If you omit, you need a permit and then it exempted vehicles. So engines that moved around are not vehicles because they don't provide propulsion. So in, in the late 80s, early 90s, they we, we as a district, some of the ones that were in non-attainment, I was San Joaquin in 94, started figuring out that our rules didn't exempt a compressor that moved from job to job. And so we say, wait a second, our rules require a permit. So we started writing tickets and getting sources to apply for permits with us. And, you know, and then all of a sudden they moved it from Stockton to Sacramento and then Oh, well, Sacramento, you need your own permit, you know, submit your huge fees and wait your uh, months to get your permit. Oh, and then you're going to go to to Davis. Oh, you need their permit. And so uh, that was the basis for the perp. And uh, as industry really uh, got fed up with all of us local districts uh, duplicating efforts. And for in early days, we tried to some of the districts tried to do a model rule where if you got registered with one district, it would be honored by other districts. Um, and the, eventually about six or seven districts adopted that type of a program, but that, that's out of 35. So that's when the PERP was introduced to the legislature. Industry pushed the legislature to adopt the PERP, and that's kind of some of the history of it. Excellent. Yeah, it's it's really it's really cool to see how PERP has progressed um, to what it is today. So really appreciate everyone's uh, insight into this. Um, if no other further questions, um, I think we do have about 20 minutes left. Um, and I wanted to ask this question to kind of put like a lens on local air district, but um, any takers on this, what is the most challenging aspect of PERP compliance within your local air district? And I'm kind of curious about Paul um, and, and the giving the ag perspective as well. So feel free to, to jump in and answer that question. Uh <laughs> It's again the misunderstanding of what the requirements are. We're dealing we deal with that quite often. We've got one we're dealing with right now where um, you know individuals some individuals believe that because they are servicing ag or working for a grower that their tub grinder or the grinding of emissions are are uh, not regulated by the district. You know that it's ag and can do you know 
what they've always done. So that's the biggest challenge is really just the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation of rules because, you know, we all do this as air district staff and engineers and, and permitters and enforcement and compliance. We do this on a day-to-day -day basis, not always on perp. Sometimes it's other things, but we deal with this all day long, every day, and it's still confusing. And there's all kinds of nuances. We often have to go back and reread the rules, have discussions, have, uh, you know, consult with our peers. So um, it's understandable that as somebody who's an in industry and trying to do their function or make their product or service, you know, provide their service, um, who doesn't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, can be confusing. So that's probably the, the biggest frustration is just the, the, the when there's a lack of communication. Thanks. And I would, I would add that, um, especially with diesel, especially with diesel engines specifically, I think our biggest challenge is when people try to try to get around um, an ATCM by registering indoors. And then we have to hunt down, well, that's not really the appropriate program. You have to be in this program. And I think people sometimes uh, intentionally or unconsciously think, you know, that they know what their engine is doing. And so they go this path and then they find out that that's the incorrect path to go for that use and type of engine. So I think that's our biggest challenge in, in working with sources is making sure they're on the right path and using the right regulation and process for compliance um, because there are so many diesel regulations out there. I thought of another really frustrating one and that's uh, when somebody buys a used piece of equipment from a rental company or from an auction yard and they buy an old diesel engine that's not current here or is past the phase out schedule you know, and they still cost them twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars, and it's a boat anchor because they bought an old one. You know, and it can't be registered. So, it, you know, in order to get registered in the statewide program at the time of registration, you have to have the latest. In general, you have to have the latest tier. So, even if they buy one that's five or ten years old, it was a tier three that if it wasn't ever registered and it wasn't a flex, and there's, there's some other nuances. But they they spend. You know, especially what's really frustrating is the little small you know, mom and pop or one operator with a concrete pump who doesn't speak English and, and spends his life savings of $50,000, but he bought somebody else's that was phasing out. And so he, he can't, there's nothing we can do for him, you know, le no legal compliance path. That's really frustrating. And I just want to piggyback off of that, Paul, a little bit is that a lot of times we'll be contacted. Somebody will reach out through the portable email or, or contact staff. We list everybody on our, our website and a lot of times folks will be at an auction and say, hey, I'm looking at this engine right here. I have this registration number and this is the serial number. And we can look up that information. Um, even if we were to put out an online registration system, you wouldn't be able to see other people's stuff. But you can always contact PERP and we can dig into it for you to make sure that is that something that's going to be eligible? Has it already phased out? Is there a problem with the prohibition of sale? Maybe they shouldn't be selling it after a certain date. Um, there is a, a schedule for that as well. So um, it's always good to reach out and just verify these things before, yeah, like Paul said, you end up dropping, you know, 20, 30, 50 grand on a piece of equipment. Um, you want to make sure that it it's it's good to operate and and you can operate it here. From an industry industry perspective, I would say that the biggest challenge we have is figuring out did we operate at a site under a stationary permit or was it a perp permit? So like when we sit down, what I'm doing right now is trying to figure out who am I reporting to? Am I reporting to CARB or am I reporting to a district? And so if you guys have perp stuff that does move around, like that's the biggest challenge is just maintaining a record of who gets what record. Because sometimes we'll be across the street doing a construction project from a stationary permit. So that's the biggest challenge. Um, but I would say that the PERP program at CARB, that is the best program. If I call somebody there, <laughs> that's one of the few times I get a phone call that is answered. And so I do appreciate your guys' efforts for sure. Like it is not a straightforward program, but I feel like you guys do put a lot of effort into responding to the questions. Um, and so I'd say anybody that has questions, 
please reach out to those guys. They are totally helpful. Um, and so are the districts on this. Some of the other programs might be a little more challenging, but the per program, someone always answers the phone. Um, but our challenge is just trying to keep records of who gets what record. That's great insight and a good feedback for, for the group, Nick. Um, Angela or Manuel, question is challenge. What are challenges in your district with PERP compliance? Um, similar to Paul and Carla, but I think it's um, when the decisions have already been made without consulting us and, and whether it's that they purchased bad equipment or they've set up an operation and they thought PERP was okay, but it's not okay. Um, that's really challenging to reverse um, bad decision making. And, um, you know, it's harder for, uh, it's easier to start up, you know, start something correctly than to stop something that's already started. So that's really frustrating, I think. Emmanuel? Yeah. And, and in general, just understanding the applicability of, of when perp equipment is allowed um, versus when a stationary source district permit might be required. Um, many of the many of the exemptions in the PERP regulation may allow PERP registered equipment for a period of time. And although it may be the, the owner or operator's intention to complete the job within that period of time, stuff happens and then deadlines get pushed out and suddenly they're requesting extensions. And so as a you know district staff, we ultimately have to commit to the timeline that's allowed and then basically when the time calls for it say okay now you've you've burnt out your your timeline here now we have to move on to the next step which would be to, to get a district permit because you've exceeded your 90 days or your 180 days or your 12 months so you know being able to to make that decision and and work that out with the applicant or the owner and operator can can be difficult at times because you know they may come back and say oh we only have 30 more days left or two more months left but oftentimes we've heard that before and then things just get drawn out. So that, that can be a challenge as well, you know, transitioning from what's allowed within the PERP domain to when a stationary source permit is required. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I see we have a question uh, about what Paul said, mentioned, what he mentioned earlier. Are there cent incentives for folks to get newer compliant equipment? I'll, I'll take the first step. It generally not. Once it's a regulation that requires a certain a reduction, then the, the any reductions are no longer surplus. So most funding sources cannot be used for those. So um, if somebody is not subject to a requirement to phase out, so you know if they wanted to upgrade a tier four to an electric or you know, but that even that for portable, you're not going to do that. But so in general, when there's a uh, a regulation that's requiring it, then there aren't incentives available. And it's, some people find that kind of contrary because they think, well, if I have to do it, I should get paid to do it. Well, there's so limited, such a limited, so limited resources for funding that we really have to use those as the, uh, as the carrot. And if we have the stick, we really can't offer the carrot. So, um, you know, we, we do use a lot of the incentives for things that aren't subject to regulation, like the tractor, the agricultural tractors that are not regulated, not required to phase down. And so if we can take $100,000 and use it on a tractor that wouldn't, is going to run for the next 40 years because the farmer doesn't have to replace it versus on a compressor for a construction company that uh, has to replace it anyway within the next couple of years, it's really a limited resources and we have to really fund it towards the ones that are surplus and not otherwise required. Yeah, I agree. There's there's not much funding available for portable equipment. Um, there's, you know, the Carl Moyer program, they usually have some forms of incentives or funding available for turnover of older equipment. But for portable, it's, it's not very common. Um, I think way back in the day, there used to be some funding, but not anymore. Um, I know through the regulation, there, there are a couple of um, like regulatory incentives um, to try to get the newest equipment into program. So if you're applying for uh, a brand new engine and it's a final tier four, we do have a temporary registration that you would be able to operate that engine until you get your final documentation. Um, if you have a flex engine, you can't apply for that. Um, so there's, there's little things like that that might be there. But as far as like grand funding for, for portable equipment turnover, we haven't seen anything.
Awesome. Um, any other questions from, from our group today? Let me look at the participant list. All right. Um, well, you know, it, it's a 150 right now. So um, we're actually, unfortunately, almost at time for our open discussion. So I really appreciate all the, the valuable questions and comments um, for this group. And um, we do have uh, some announcements for today before we wrap up the meeting. So I'm going to actually hand it over to Adrian for announcements. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kathy. And, and thank you to everyone for participating in our, our Cleaner Air Partnership Technical Advisory Committee meeting. You know, we do these regularly uh, at, intended to do a deep dive into a technical issue. And, and this was a technical issue, but I feel like I've learned a ton about portable equipment. Um, so really do appreciate everyone's contributions. Um, another thing that CAP does is we have quarterly free luncheons. Um, yes, with food, we feed you. Um, and I just dropped in the chat a link to our next one, which is on Friday, March 8th. It's going to be at the Oak Park Community Center in Sacramento. And we're partnering with uh, Angela's team at the Sac Metro Air District to check out the, um, the work that they've been doing around the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, um, identifying um, priorities for our region in reducing pollution and taking funding climate action. So uh, exciting work that's been going uh, on there, uh, uh, representative of the the larger Sacramento region um, and hope that you all can join us and we'll feed you. Uh, and again, that's Friday, March 8th from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Uh, and then the other thing we've been working on, so that one's in Sacramento, but we have another event coming up on April 8th, which is a Monday in Placer County. So there's the link to that. Um, we're actually gonna do a bus tour. We're gonna take about 50 people, so seats are limited, 50 people to various biomass and forest management sites around Placer County. Um, so really excited about this. It's gonna be just about an all day thing. Um, and again, filling out this interest form doesn't guarantee that you can participate, but we'd love to have a good cross section of clean air folks participating in that who wanna learn about kind of the, the latest in the, you know, the biomass conversation, the biomass to energy conversation uh, or, or kind of the forest management and wildfire prevention conversation. Uh, so exciting stuff that all kind of ties into some work we're trying to do around federal advocacy as well. Um, hope you guys can, can come uh, meet up with us at one of these two upcoming events. Um, so thank you and back to you, Kathy. Yes, appreciate that, Adrian, for the announcements. Um, so you're really, 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 really looking forward to seeing some of you at those um, events that we have scheduled. Um, but, you know, to close this meeting, I, I really want to extend a, a huge thank you to our speakers, Kelly from the Air Resources Board and Carla, Angela, Emmanuel, and Paul from our region's local air districts. Uh, appreciate you joining us today out of your busy schedules and providing your, your very valuable insights on PERP. Um, lastly, I want to thank our Cleaner Air Partnership contributors for guiding and supporting our CAP events, which we have regularly scheduled every year. Um, and, you know, last but not least, I would like to extend a huge thank you to our attendees for tuning in with us today. Um, we'll follow up with an email with relevant resources and links. There will be a, a recording for today's meeting at our, on our Value Vision YouTube channel as well. And I just want to say uh, thanks and have a happy Valentine's Day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Bye.